Welcome to Reboot Series 3. This is the third and final webinar series brought to you by the City of Sydney. I'm Rebecca Campbell. I'll be hosting this event. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which much of us are meeting on today, the Gadigal people and their elders past and present. And because we are online and lots of us are in all sorts of different locations, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands in which we are all meeting on today and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating um, in this event. So in a moment, I will introduce Sasha Gusain and Tom Hunt, and we'll be talking about everything you can do to leverage Google to grow your business. Um, but first, a couple of words from our Lord Mayor, Clover Moore. Thank you, Rebecca, and hello, everyone. Welcome to our Reboot Seminars for 2021. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of our land, part of the oldest living culture on earth, and I pay my respects to their elders. I also acknowledge the people of the many nations who live in our city. And I'd also like to welcome the many local experts participating in the Reboot series and sharing their knowledge with our small businesses and startup community. Last year at the height of the pandemic, the city surveyed our business community to learn what you need to survive and to recover from the damage brought about by COVID. In response to what you told us, we launched the Reboots webinars to equip you with the skills and strategies that will help you thrive in these challenging times. So thank you for your interest in attending today. And I'll leave you with Rebecca and our local experts to advise you on how to strategize and plan for growth in this ever changing economic environment. Thank you and big thanks to the City of Sydney for putting on this series. Um, we've had 12 awesome events so far. So if this is your first Reboot event, welcome. Uh, we're going to share in chat a link which will take you to videos of the previous 12 events. So we've had events on lots of events in digital marketing, content marketing. We had a lot of events last series on leadership, capital raising. We've had founders of Employment Hero, Vino Mofo, TEDx Sydney. Uh, we had the global CEO of Zero last series. So I would encourage you to check out any of those videos um, if you've missed them because there's been some great content. Um, we have 500, there's more than 500 actually, Sydney business owners who have registered to attend today. So it's an amazing how this webinar series has brought the community together. Um, we've had photos of, of your offices. I know that many businesses are playing um, these webinars in their offices for their whole teams on Mondays at lunchtime. We will be here for the next six Mondays um, and we'll be telling you a bit more about the other events that we have coming up um, and sharing links to those events at the end of this event today. The format for today is we'll start with um, quick presentations from Sasha and from Tom. Sasha is going to be talking about SEO um, and organic growth. Tom is going to be talking about Google Analytics and AdWords. And then we're bringing on two Sydney case study businesses. So we have um, Sam and Aaron, who will be introducing their businesses and then asking questions about how they can best Google leverage Google's and some of the challenges that they've had um, using Google to grow their business. Um, and I hope that many of you will be able to relate to these challenges and these questions and, and, and learn content that will, be, that will be useful for your business. So first up, I now want to introduce Sasha. So I learned about Sasha um, as she's currently running C SEO at Canva. She joined um, Canva from High Pages in, I think, 2016. Um, Canva is obviously very well known for their incredible um, SEO and landing page strategy. Um, but the last two years, Sasha has been consulting to a number of businesses, including Airtasker. Um, she is the, known as one of the best consultants in Sydney on SEO and organic growth. So I'll hand over to you, Sasha, for your presentation. Awesome. Um, thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, thanks for that awesome introduction um, and also for setting up this, um, this awesome program. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, so here's a quick summary of who I am and why I talk about SEO a lot. Apart from running SEO teams at Canva and advising other startups, I also run my very own bootstrapped business, which is an animal rescue fundraiser shop. So I 100% understand the challenges of scalable SEO for small businesses. Um, so let's uh, get into it. Uh, what is SEO for organic growth and how can it help grow your customer base? So I'm going to be talking about um, what is SEO for discovery, which is a really important concept uh, for your strategy. How do high growth companies like Canva approach it? How we can use these learnings for any business? 
And what are some of the technical SEO must-haves that every website needs? Um, so yeah, what is SEO for discovery? So put quite simply, it's SEO work that ensures your website is discovered by customers right when they search for something that strongly relates to your business. So a really great way to do this is to use the jobs to be done framework, which essentially aligns products, your product, with search terms. Think of a job to be done as the main overarching intent behind any search term. So to understand these, we do a fair bit of competitor analysis, keyword research, and we group different user intents within categories, which then leads to choosing a website structure, creating scalable or non-scalable content pages, setting up ops for production, and then also planning user journeys. All of this is very much part of SEO work and does sort of overlap with a few other functions from, um, from advertising, social media marketing, and also lifecycle marketing. Um, so how do we approach this in companies like Canva, Airtasker, Pinterest, um, and House, High Pages, etc.? So we usually do this um, by spending a lot of time on researching user intent. Um, and what, what, what we normally do is we map different user intents to different parts of the website. And so this can be as broad as a generic poster intent or as specific as a teacher looking for climate action poster templates to print posters for a class workshop on global warming. And we do have a page for exactly that. And this then translates into a user-friendly website structure that you can see here, um, split into two sides. So you've got the do or the create side where the job to be done is to do or create something. And then you've got the discover side, which is, you know, I'm looking for a customizable template that fits X, Y, Z criteria. What this does really well is it combines or groups specific pages for popular jobs to be done. And this makes sure that our internal links are user-friendly, which basically means that we design navigation to directly address how a user wants to engage with our content. So at every stage of SEO, um, you have to keep focusing on what the user needs and how can you help this user achieve an outcome. And if we expand this concept of user intent to different industries, here's what we see. Um, if you have a consumer tech product, um, you're generally addressing informational intent. So that's like gathering ideas. Um, you know, how do I create something? How do I do something? And translate tr uh, transactional intents like doing something or achieving a task. So for example, I want to print cards or I want to hire a hairdresser near me, which incidentally is Airtasker's top keyword. So if you have an on-demand service, you're addressing informational intents, such as information on how something is done and transactional intents like finding someone to do it and finding them to do it in your specific location. So I did um, take some, draw some inspiration from the questions um, that Sam, um, one of the people in our panel today had asked um, being a franchise owner, um, a mortgage broker with a franchise. So let's address this case study here. So you've got a mortgage broker who has bought into a franchise business, relies on Google for new leads. So there are two scenarios um, that, we, that, that can play out. So the first one is that you can influence what's on your main franchise domain. If this is true, then there are some things you can do to address popular intents. And if not, you would need to verify your business with Google and get lots of reviews so that anyone searching from your region sees your business in their local business recommendations. We, we might revisit this um, slide a little later. Um, if you can influence what's on the franchise website, then a popular intent to target is um, the search term mortgage repayment calculator, which is really popular, 62,000 monthly searches for it. And you can see one of the top performers outside of the big banks is Mortgage Choice. Now, why is Mortgage Choice performing for this over and above all the other businesses out there? Um, because their calculator page is really well laid out in terms of really helpful explainer content. You've got how-to blocks that are also marked up for schema so that that's your structured data at play. So a lot of times this is going to result in rich snippet results on Google page one. And then you also have step-by-step um, -step guides, quick tips, and a local broker selector, which is really important because it tells Google that um, you've got something for everyone from this page. 
Um, another case study, also um, drawing inspiration from the questions and we might revisit this later, is an online shop for a new game product. Now, um, this is selling a brand new physical product. Um, and before we get into this, you should remember that SEO doesn't always have to be your first channel for user growth. It can be a supporting channel, in which case you would most likely optimize the website for brand terms, which is your company name, or alongside other, other channels such as social media or ads or emails. With that context, um, some basics that need to be covered, um, such as structured data, um, you know, rich snippets, etc., um, is important. So this is essentially information that's used by Google to understand the context of your website. Um, content, and it's important for e-commerce websites, especially for brand and product information. Again, we might revisit this um, a little later. So let's work through one example really quickly. Um, this is the intent of Spotify party search terms. In this case, um, you would basically write off the popularity of Spotify to showcase your product, uh, which you know uses this um, streaming service to play the game. And you would rely on distribution because um, by itself, since this is a new category, it might not 100% cover everything that you're after. And then also relate it with other themes um, such as storytelling, because this provides um, much deeper context for Google to understand what your game is about. So now that we have all our strategy work in place, how do we translate that into a website? Some basic technical SEO must-haves and top things to remember um, are outlined over here, uh, but essentially that's three things that you're after. First is structure. So Google loves a well-structured website and you know, think UX first um, if you have a great UX um, team or person at hand, but um, well-structured websites are important. On-page optimizations, make sure your content is secure and unique. Um, search results, that involves meta descriptions, responsive results, your page needs to be 100% um, responsive on mobile or tablet, and really good internal linking. Um, and that's all of it. Um, it was quite a challenge to simplify everything into 10 odd slides, uh, but I appreciate there's a lot more information you, can, uh, you would be after and you can now search for it with a slightly more specific intent. Um, three top takeaways, SEO works better when it sits with product and business planning before the marketing function kicks in. Um, SEO teams must work closely with other teams to have high impact and good SEO is very, very specific to what makes your customer's life easy. And that's it for me. Um, hope that was useful. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Sasha. That was awesome. Um, so as Sasha mentioned, we have two case study businesses coming up. We have Sam, um, who's a mortgage broker, has a mortgage broker business in North Ride. Um, and we also have Aaron, who has a, um, a, an e-commerce store um, that he would like to ask questions on. So some of Sasha's slides related to them. Um, they will be covering both kind of the more simple starting out questions from Sam. And then we also have some more advanced SEO questions coming from Aaron as well. So next, I'm very excited to introduce Tom. So I have actually never met anyone um, <laughs> who gets as, as excited and passionate about Google AdWords and Google Analytics as Tom Hunt. So Tom is a highly sought after digital marketing consultant. He's best known as um, being key to the team that built Koala Mattresses' incredible marketing ma machine from zero to $100 million in revenue in three years. Um, Tom was responsible for the Google AdWords and the um, analytics strategy behind the growth of that business. Um, and I'll hand to Tom to talk about the next phase of the next part of Google, Google AdWords and Google Analytics. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. That was a lovely introduction. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, as Rebecca Flagg, my name is Tom. Uh, my background, I mean, most recently, I was at Koala uh, working in the marketing team, especially around data-driven marketing and the sort of data infrastructure to you know, buy and, and analyze the ads. Uh, to that end, I've spent a lot of time trying to work out how to uh, get the most out of the tools that you have to try and understand reality better and you know, subsequently make more money. Um, analytics and AdWords or, or various parts of the Google stack are, are a huge part of that. Um, so I want to try and today just give you a bit of an overview of how I see both AdWords and analytics intersecting with a marketing mix that a business might have, the roles that they play. And I want to give you an overview uh, which should lead as a sort of like
like jumping off point to try and understand how it might help you. Um, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty to make you like an expert search engine marketing buyer. Uh, that would take weeks, not 10 minutes, uh, but hopefully you'll get an idea about how to approach some of the questions that you might have. So, AdWords. Also, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, low level uh, sort of presentation. Uh, if that's, if you believe that that's a philosophical stance, that's, uh, that's good. Um, firstly, what is AdWords? Uh, as you can see, ads, when you search for things. Um, obviously, you're all aware of the ads that come up at the top of Google searches, but there are also some other uh, display placements that you can get in AdWords, such as slightly to the right here, these shopping-based ads, and even um, things like map results. So Google AdWords goes a little bit beyond um, just search results in Google, but fundamentally, what AdWords is extremely good at is capturing people who are in the process of looking for your product, right? So it's a pull channel, it's capturing demand. You're not going out and interrupting people to tell them about your product, but at the point that they're searching for your thing or something like your thing, you can put your message in front of them. It also, as a paid channel, as opposed to SEO, allows you to turn traffic on and off with a flick of a button. So uh, it's very, very good to allow you to test or attempt to amplify things that are already working well. Everything that Sasha said about correctly structuring your pages, correctly structuring your content, making sure that things are aligned with the purposes that your users and potential customers have is essential. And then, um, you know, from that point, you can amplify this, boost it and accelerate it by putting money into AdWords to send people to that content. Um, it's easy to do, it's very easy to start, it's extraordinarily hard to do very, very well. That's AdWords in a nutshell, basically. The key thing that I want you to take away from this is that it does not generate demand. AdWords will not make people aware of your product or make people aware of the need that they have for your product. It will capture intent, whether that intent is for your specific brand and people searching for your brand, or more broadly, people searching for the category you can capture when people are searching, but you can't make somebody search with an AdWords. So, or with an AdWords campaign. So this means that it's essential to run AdWords in the context of the rest of your marketing mix. We'll circle back around to this, but you should never be running it uh, alone or as your primary channel. Uh, it will get very expensive and, and you won't see the benefits of a more sort of holistic marketing mix. But let's talk very briefly about how it works technically. I am not gonna go more in depth than this. Uh, you can reach out to me after and we can have a chat about it. But fundamentally, um, with an AdWords campaign, you set up the keywords that you are seeking to uh, address, or the keywords that you want to appear on when people search. You set a budget, you set some targeting options, such as you know what geographies, and then an objective, whether you're paying for uh, impressions, which is the number of people who see your ads, clicks, there's the number of people who actually click on your ads, or even uh, a conversion objective, such as a, a purchase. So that's slightly more complicated. Then you set the landing page that people are gonna be sent to when they click on the ad, and you press go. Google will then automatically push all of this information through auctions that occur every time um, an ad is run, right? So every time somebody, or sorry, a search is run, every time somebody searches for something on Google, in that split second, every advertiser who has uh, aligned with those keywords will be shown your ad or one of your competitor's ads, depending on your budgeting. The ads are then displayed, uh, as I showed you before, um, and then at the end of that, you get reporting on impressions, clicks, uh, the amount of budget that was spent, and importantly, something called your ad quality score. Uh, Google actually penalizes ads that appear to be providing a bad user experience and elevates ads that appear to be highly relevant um, and a good experience for users. So um, again, speaks back to the exact same principles as SEO. You wanna make sure that you understand very clearly what people are looking for. You wanna make sure that the landing page that they see when they click on your ad is immediately relevant and you will actually be rewarded by the algorithm for that good positive UX. A lot of really uh, scammy or you know, black hat stuff that marketers do is more and more being pushed away and successfully uh, actually penalized by the Google alg algorithm. So, you know, just try and do everything in good faith, basically. So if you are starting to run AdWords, what is the process of, of trying to iterate or optimize an AdWords campaign? You know, there are a set number of 
uh, sort of elements between your targeting with the keywords that you're choosing and, and the way that you're carving out or trying to identify and capture that intent. There is a different ad creative that you have available, uh, whether that's text or, or images, if you're using the, the shopping network or, or search, and then the different landing page experiences. Fundamentally, those are the levers that are available to you, and any good AdWords uh, optimization campaign will be an extremely iterative and systematic sort of step-by-step -step through each of those elements. You know, are we targeting the right keywords? Can we try new keywords? Are we using the right creative? Can we try new creative? Do we have the right landing page? As you can tell, this is a very, very involved process. It's quite time consuming and it requires a, a, a comfort with making the you know, inferences of you know, change and result, change and result over a long period of time. So as soon as you're spending, uh, I would say around $1,000 a week, you really should consider having an agency partner as a small business uh, or even somebody you know, in-house who's able to run this. It, it, is, it is possible but difficult to drive results from AdWords by sort of setting it and forgetting it. The, the proper care and feeding of your AdWords account is crucial. So in that case, how can you use AdWords as a business without a huge budget, right? You don't need to have it always on. You don't need to treat it as a, a, a primary channel. As a smaller business, if there is a big spike in demand, either for your market, for your brand, maybe something's on TV, or maybe there's like a big organic brand moment, you know, you have a video that goes viral or something, you should make sure that you run AdWords to capture that demand, capture a big spike in interest in your brand or in your market. You should also be defending your brand keywords. If your competitors are, um, bidding on your brand name, obviously they're gonna be trying to siphon traffic away from you. You know, you should be making sure that anyone who Googles for your brand, the highest possible intent is seeing your ads. Thirdly, you should definitely be trying to take advantage of the highly relevant options like shopping ads and maps ads. So this is where Google's moved away from purely search, but if somebody is trying to go through Google shopping or even looking up something on Google maps, uh, this is something where you can still extract value because of the hyper-targeted and hyper-local version of it um, or targeting options that you get. And I apologize for the clicking in the background. Uh, that is something on my Slack as people are hitting up my website. Sorry about that. Most importantly, most interestingly, um, you can create remarketing audiences out of the traffic from AdWords. So something that people will often do is run a campaign, have a whole bunch of people come to the website because people are searching for their product or are searching for uh, you know, their, their market. And then everyone comes to the site and for one reason or another, maybe their page isn't properly optimized, or maybe they're not quite, they haven't quite nailed the communication with the customers, all of these people leave. Um, again, AdWords should not be used uh, alone. If you have, say, a Facebook pixel on your website, you should be able to retarget these people through Facebook. You know, you should take a second bite at the apple. You should, you should be able to communicate back with people who've been on your page through other channels. Finally, similarly, if you're not quite sure about the best way to communicate with your uh, customers yet, this is where AdWords and SEO diverge. You can turn it on and off. Come up with a hypothesis about a, a unique selling proposition for your brand, put it in an ad word, uh, run it, see if it goes well. And if it does, that's brilliant. You know, you've just learned something about your market. If it doesn't, you can simply turn it off and try something else. So this, I think, is the most exciting thing about AdWords for a small advertiser. You can use AdWords as a form of market research. It is extremely slow to do proper uh a B testing where you have you know two different versions of a web page and you know one of them seems to work better than the other. Uh, it's extremely slow when you have low traffic. But if you have an idea about a reason that people engage with your product and you put it on a um, uh, you just put it in a Google ad, you can see extremely quickly whether or not people are engaging with that ad versus an ad with a different piece of copy or a different piece of creative. So it allows you to A-B test and achieve statistical significance extremely quickly and relatively cheaply. Um, this is something I think AdWords is excellent for. Now, what that requires is a very good understanding of what's actually happening on the page. Are people clicking? Does it all make sense? This is where Google Analytics comes in. And Google Analytics, I without irony, think is one of the most important marketing tools that has been invented in the last 100 years. Let's talk about why. So all Google Analytics does is track users that have come to your page. It tells you where they came from and what pages they looked at. That's it. There's a number of slightly more advanced uh, pieces of reporting, but fundamentally, it just tells you the number of people who looked at what pages. That 
is actually hugely valuable if all you want to know is how your advertising mix is going in driving people to your page. So the most important part of that is using something called UTMs. UTMs, oops, oh no, sorry. We're gonna to jump to UTMs in a second. Here's an example of what a report looks like. Um, and I've blanked out some client identifying information, but fundamentally, if you go into Google Analytics, as you can just see, this nice sort of upwards trend of traffic you know, over a period of time, and then a bit of a downwards trend afterwards. This is how many people are coming to your webpage, right? UTMs are important because they allow you to actually break down uh, you know, where traffic is coming from, what marketing campaigns are driving the uplift that you're seeing to your website, and what efforts that you're putting out into your world are actually resulting in more people engaging with your brand. So what actually are UTMs? I've been using the term over and over again. It is simply some extra information that you put on the end of every link to your website. So whether or not there's a link to your website in uh, an email or a link to your website in uh, a Google ad that you're running or a link to your website in a blog post or a link to your website on Facebook, wherever somebody can click on a link to your website, that link should include UTMs that define, you know, what campaign is this? What channel is this? You know, what piece of creative is this? There are a number of predefined bits of information or categories of information that you can attach to a URL, but they're entirely arbitrary, right? Uh, Neil Patel has a really good uh, blog on this. You can see it down at the bottom here for more details. But so what UTMs allow you to do is break down not just are more people coming to your website, but where are they coming from? So you can see the example here, uh, website, buffer, guest blogging guide, eight day content, Kikolani, new Gmail. Now, what does that mean? Who knows, it doesn't matter. Those are arbitrary labels. But what's cool is that the marketer looking at that goes, oh look, new Gmail. Uh, we thought it was going to be a really big campaign, but actually we only got 33 visits. So maybe that didn't work. You know, it gives you that clarity. A really quick worked example before I uh, wrap up. Here's again another example of a report that you would get out of Google Analytics. You can see through April, uh, a number of people coming to the web page, a number of sessions on the web page. And then on the 29th, there's a bit of a, a bit of a bump. If you aren't tagging the links of how people come to your website, you, that's it. You see a bump. You're not really sure why. Oops, I'm top fell. But with the power of UTMs, you can say, each of these colors being a different channel, a different type of link. Okay, orange was pretty flat throughout that period. Green was pretty flat throughout that period. Purple was pretty flat throughout that period. But look at this, it is the yellow campaign, which actually spiked on the 29th. Then you go back and you think, cool, you know, say that's a, an email that we sent out. That actually worked really well. It had a meaningful impact, brilliant. That's only achievable with UTMs and Google Analytics. And that is it. That Thank is you, Tom. And I did tell you that there would be no, you would not find anybody who is more passionate about Google Ads um, and Google Analytics than Tom. Um, so thank you for your passion there, Tom. And we have shared links to both Tom and Sasha's websites um, if you would like to learn more about them individually. Um, so as I said before, we're starting, we've got two businesses to ask questions today. Sam, who is from a business called MoneyQuest, in, which is a mortgage broker in North Wright. So Sam has some more fundamental Google search and Google AdWord questions to put to Sasha and, and, and Tom. And then we will be introducing Aaron from Song Saga, who has some more advanced SEO and Google ad analytics questions for Sasha and Thomas. So we're, so we're going to try and cover you know, the spectrum of businesses today. But first up, Sam, if you could give us a really quick um, introduction of your business. And then if you could put your first two questions to Sasha together, that would be great. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, um, hello and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Side. Uh, we're basically a mortgage brokerage business. Uh, mortgage brokerage, basically, we look after everything to do with home loans, investment loans, car financing, uh, credit impaired, everything covering about 50 plus lenders across Australia, not limited to my one wonderful North Ride. That session was really, really informative from Tom and Sasha, but it also tells me how little I know about the world of digital marketing. And I'm just trying to take, uh, uh, which is basically, I guess this for Sasha. Uh, I know a lot about my business, but when you talk about like SEO keywords, how does one go about finding keywords? Is there a registry I should look up or what? Yeah, that's a really good question, Sam. Uh, I'm going to quickly share my screen, Rebecca. Is that all good? 
So what you're seeing in front of you right now is a tool called, called Ahrefs. Uh, this is one of the, I would say, two to three tools available to you. So ahrefs.com. Um, once you, I think there's a free tier here as well, but, um, and it's also like, if you would like to invest in it, I mean, this is one of the first tools that I invested in for my own business. It's about 60 to 80 bucks a month, but well worth it because it really helps you find a lot of very good keywords. Um, so what you're seeing right now is a, is the initial dashboard as you land on it. Um, the way I go about it is, um, so if you remember, I spoke a lot about intent and what is the exact thing that your business is helping users achieve. So let's say um, you're looking at mortgage um, repayments, and that's what I had uh, mentioned in the, in the um, presentation as well. Um, so you'll notice over here, you've got all the different uh, search engines as YouTube as well. So, that, you know, for anyone um, who has a lot of YouTube content, you can also use this tool to understand what are the YouTube terms that people are searching for on YouTube. But if we're sticking to Google, let's punch in that keyword. So that's not, not at this point, it's not a keyword. It's what your business is doing for people. So you're providing mortgages. And so mortgage repayments is a subject area in that realm. We're going to stick to Australia and within Australia, let's have a look at what your landscape looks like. So what you see in front of you right now is a bird's eye view of the world of mortgage uh, repayments, including how difficult it is to rank for it. Um, so 52 is hard. I mean, mortgages are a super hot topic right now and you know, even generally, but especially right now. So you'll see a lot of action in terms of different landing pages. And you've also got a lot of legacy content uh, from, the, from the big banks. Um, you'll see some information on CPC and clicks, etc. cetera. Um, this, this is all notional. Um, I think the AdWord tool and what Tom will tell you about that would be high, a lot more accurate than this. Uh, but what we're really interested in uh, and referring to your question is how do we find these keywords? So with tools like these, you're going to have um, three types of keywords that relate to the root term that you just added in here, which is mortgage repayments. Um, so having the same term, so these are phrases that either contain it or are that exact term, and that's going to be a list that you will get straight from here alongside search volume. So these numbers that you're seeing next to it are the exact, you know, are the monthly searches um, that each of these terms command. Um, questions, which are also really good content for SEO. So these are very obvious um, questions that people are asking on search. So um, how to work out mortgage repayments, how much will um, they be, et cetera. These are long tail questions. So we call them long tail because um, you've got fewer searches, uh, but the intent is a lot higher. So the more specific you get, um, the lower the search volume will get, but at the same time, the higher your chances of converting someone um, from a page that answers that exact question. And then also rank four is a good way for you to understand what is the related content. And so when you get in, so low hanging fruit always is a list of terms that have um, that root term that you've entered. And so these are all the keywords that you can now begin investigating. Um, tools like Ahrefs and SEMrush, I'll drop the links um, in the chat below after this, um, will club these um, keyword terms into different intents. So for example, the terms themselves relate to mortgage, repayments, calculator, so the intent to calculate something is super high, um, and so on. Um, and then you've got your parent topics. So these are the large sort of groups um, that I was talking about earlier. And so um, this is one, one way to do it. So if you take any other um, thing, I suppose, let's say refinancing. So that'll also give you a good idea about, you know, what are the terms that you're looking at? And what we typically do is export these lists and then spend a lot of time on spreadsheets, grouping them, investigating what are the search results for the ones that we want to target, what kind of URLs are ranking for it, which is a good indication of how Google is prioritizing different types of content for that term. And so this is the sort of investigation that you can do some of it yourself, but then if you are hiring somebody or you know um, your franchise has a team that takes care of it, you would go into it and, and say that, well, I think this is a high priority term, and then that would lead to creating a strategy around that. Okay. Um, well, in, in my uh, field of work, 
uh, the general concept is easy to do marketing. You can even outsource it, but prospecting is basically where the real uh, treasure is. But what I'm finding is that I'm actually doing more marketing. So should I be looking at um, Google reviews, uh, AdWords I'm stuff? In, we're just having some trouble with your audio. Um, I'm just going to jump in and ask your question because I, I have your questions written here as well. So just as a, um, and sorry, um, as a small business owner, questions around Google reviews. How important are Google reviews and when should Sam start thinking about it for his business, given that he's a new business? Um, yeah, so Google reviews are, are really important because uh, ratings and reviews are, are a good trust signal. And um, the more Google cleans up the way it presents results, um, you know, the more it focuses on things that would make that page highly relevant. So definitely get your business verified on Google My Business. Make sure that it shows up um, on local business recommendations. Um, you know, when somebody looks for mortgage brokers in their area. But then also you'd have to look at your actual website and see if your local, um, the, the URL that mentions your exact business has structured data. So the rich snippet, which is your address, your contact information and your name um, needs to be mentioned. So I did a quick check for uh, MoneyQuest Northright and I found that someone from North Sydney, like there were other people ranking for the very specific term of yours in the local business results. So that means there's something missing with either your markup on the website, which is where you can you know, send a request to whoever's running the website and ask them if that's been done properly um, on the page. Um, as well as, you know, if you can also, if, if you haven't had your business verified on Google My Business, that would, I, I would do that on priority and then also begin collecting lots of reviews um, that, you know, talk about the different types of um, loans that you help people with. So don't go after them with a generic intent in mind. Uh, ask them to specifically talk about the service that they got from you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So Sam, you had a couple of questions for Tom. Thank you, Sasha, just on um, on Google AdWords and what you should be thinking about as a new small business. Yes, uh, to, Tom, so so basically in my early journey with the business, at what level should I start considering AdWords? So um, this, is a, this is a very interesting question because especially in your market, um, any, any situation or any business where the, the sort of lifetime value of a customer or even the immediate value of a customer is extremely high, uh, uh, potentially even measured in thousands of dollars, um, is going to have absolutely vicious Google AdWords bidding. Because obviously, you know, this is somebody right at the end of their journey to make a purchase decision. And so the amount of money that you're willing to get them to look at you, uh, willing to spend rather, to get them to look at you is very, very high. So in financial services, uh, in legal services, uh, in lockpicks, <laughs> for example, because it's quite high sort of uh, salience, somebody needs a lockpick uh, right now, um, bids tend to be extremely high and extremely sophisticated. And that being said, Mortgage Quest is, uh, sorry, Money Quest rather, is doing uh, some AdWords. I would not recommend that uh, you as a franchisee uh, attempt it yourself simply because the, the, the teams that you would be competing against uh, are quite large. And at the end of the day, um, you, know, you would probably be better focused on more local efforts, right? Like your uh, sort of strategic advantage that you have over large AdWord ad buying teams is your connection to the local area. You can do things there that they can't. So like at what point should you consider starting to buy AdWords? Like as soon as there's enough demand uh, to justify it for your brand, you should be defending your brand term, lest your competitors go in and try and steal people away when they're about to convert to you. But when you're talking about- Explain Tom what that means, just to defending uh, your brand term, I think that's an important point. So, so um, when you're buying uh, keywords for, for AdWords, you can either buy uh, keywords that are focused on your brand. So if somebody were to type in, uh, you know, Money Quest, for example, uh, they're looking for you and you want to make sure that your competitor does not have an ad above yours, you know, because then they're going to be siphoned away from you. As opposed to what we call a generic term, uh, which is if somebody was merely looking for, uh, you know, home loans, for example, or financial services, um, you know, there is going to be a lot of competition for those terms and the the 
the, the, the amount of money you would be able to make out of people who are still at quite a high level of the journey is going to be less. So it's, it's a much thinner margin. It's a more complicated uh, proposition. So you should be defending your brand uh, and, and your brand searches very, very quickly. Uh, but you should how quickly you should get into a generic search and trying to capture sort of general market demand through AdWords uh, is very, very dependent on how competitive uh, your, your particular niche is, and you know, financial services are extremely niche, uh, so you're gonna have stiff competition, um, and also how confident you are in your on-page experience. So if you have already seen from other advertising you're doing or from successful SEO, that when somebody comes to the web page, uh, they convert, you know, they, they get what they need, uh, the value is clear, and the next step where they, you know, get in contact with you or, or whatever the next step is, uh, works, then you can be confident uh, attempting it. But um, it, it really should be considered, or AdWords, uh, until you reach a reasonably high level of sophistication, should be considered more as a supporting channel, you know. Thank so you, Tom. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'm going to now bring on Aaron. So Aaron has a business called Song Saga, which I hadn't heard of until we... Um, we spoke, although I had heard of Aaron because Aaron has a impressive background in advertising. So you already know a lot about this um, and you have got some more advanced questions for Sasha and Tom. Um, Aaron, do you want to start by telling us a little about SongQuest and your challenges, you know, or victories using Google so far and then put your questions. I think you've got the first questions to Sasha. Yeah, sure. It's Money Quest and Song Saga, <laughs> not Song Quest. Song Quest is a different game. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, so Song Saga is a party game for adults. It's basically what the, the way I describe it is, is when you play, you take a musical trip down memory lane. Um, it's a box full of cards, and every card in the box is designed to spark a memory of the music and moments that have meaning to you. And when you every time you play, it's like a uh, um, joyful connection with the people you're playing with and recollection to the memories uh, of your life. So it's it's a really um, interesting, fun experience. It is a game that people can play and win when they play Song Saga. But what we found is most people just simply kind of devolve into awesome conversation and listening and rediscovering great new music. So. So that's that's a background on Song Saga. And I guess my first question for Sasha is, because it's a party game that doesn't quite fit most of the mold of all the other existing games in the world, like um, most party games sort of are around drinking or super competitive. This is less competitive and more about connection and storytelling and, and song sharing. And um, or else they're games that like have a super niche audience and they have like dragons and wizards and knights in the game, right? So this is Song Saga is super unique. And because of that, I don't feel like there's strong user intent, right? And you mentioned a couple of examples in your pitch deck and that got me thinking. And in fact, I think instinctively we're already doing a little bit like our most popular blog post is how to use Spotify's um, party mode, right? Yeah, yeah, party mode. So like, I mean, I made that video in a half hour and it's just, it's like the number one page on our site. So I get that user intent works when you're kind of leveraging off someone else's thing, but what might we be able to do to um, harness SEO to get people who aren't looking for this kind of game, who don't know it exists to discover Song Saga? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And also because you're, you're essentially creating something so new, not just in terms of a category, but also in terms of a habit. Um, and you're introducing a completely new spin on how somebody can, you know, enjoy things as a group. Um, so when I had a look at your website, first of all, very good work on all the structured data. All your markup is 100% up to scratch. Like I wouldn't add anything to it. I, I ran it through a few tools and I checked all of that. Everything is in great shape. Um, so you've got the brand schema in place. You've got your product schema in place, as well as reviews and video objects. All of that is, um, is great. Um, so what you've done is you've created really strong brand SEO. So the more you talk about Song Saga in your podcasts, in the different videos, and all the different community outreach that you do for it, um, you're basically creating search volume. And that's um, you know, something that will take time. And once you have a little more traction in terms of brand SEO going up, that's when you'll be able to leverage that against a lot of the supporting terms, which is storytelling and all the different themes that are really close to your product. Um, so I saw that you also have different streaming services um, aside from just Spotify. Spotify is, of course, the most um, popular one. Um, I would 
at this stage for you, not chase only search volume. I would say, yes, 100%, go ahead and do some more Spotify stuff, like the group sessions post that you had. Um, it's important at this stage for you to not have just one video for it, but several videos that have something related and connecting them to the same sort of overarching group. Um, and that's a mistake that, you know, I've made for myself um, in the past where I put up one really amazing guide on how to rescue a dog from a shelter. And then I um, sit back and I not, don't add to that. So keep adding to that theme, that, you know, that world. Um, but then also leverage all of that in your, in your outreach definitely talk about it and link back to it from wherever you can. Um, so at this stage, I wouldn't think that um, informational SEO is your best friend. Um, at this stage, probably ads and social marketing should be your primary channels. Um, and then circling back to SEO in the future, maybe in another three to six months, um, is what I would suggest once you've sort of had a chance to really grow your um, brand name a bit. Yeah, cool. That's super helpful. So in terms of... Um the content that already that's that exists that's already getting traction like that, how to use Spotify um, party mode video. Yeah. Your suggestion is to not not to not let that be the only thing, but keep adding to that specific topic. That's right. That's right. And also because um, you can use that in different ways. So that content will get used in, you know, it, there is informational um, boosting of content as well. So it an ad doesn't, I'm, I'm sorry, Don, I think you probably refer to that, but it's an ad would not always send people into a transactional page. It can also send people to a fun page or something that you want people to associate with your brand. And so you're basically killing two, um, wrong analogy, you're, you're doing two things with the same intent. So you're um, publishing that for long tail SEO, but in the short term, you can use that really cleverly um, on co-marketing, emails with other brands that are related to you or with um, ad ads as well. Yeah, cool. Great. Okay. So um, second question, you maybe touched on it, but it was around schema. I guess um, my original question was about setting up schema for our business. It sounds like we did a pretty good job based on your research, which is awesome to hear. So um, rather than kind of asking about, I mean, I'd love to hear I guess for the benefit of the other people on this call, effective tips for using schema, and maybe you can explain for everyone who doesn't know what it is. The specific question that I have now is, um, what is the difference between schema and rich snippets? Um, so rich snippets is it, it essentially belongs to the same thing. You have you you use markup language on your page, and by markup, I mean I just mean you identify in HTML tags um, on your page. Um, something that tells Google um, what that page is about. So if it's a product page, it's going to be schema around the product title, that is your product name, um, you know, how many of that product you have available, as well as the pricing and, you know, all this information, descriptions, etc. cetera. Um, and likewise for ratings and reviews. So it's essentially um, markup in the HTML of your page, sure, but at the same time, not everyone has access to engineering that's going to do this for you from scratch. Um, so what you would then use is an out of the box website builder. So a lot of people use WordPress and Webflow is becoming more and more popular now. Uh, most of these um, out of the box website builders have um, structured data in like, plugins um, that you can use. Um, and so Yoast, for example, is really popular for meta titles and descriptions, but then you also have a lot of other related uh, plugins that you can use for product and brand um, schema. So it really depends on the website builder you use. Um, if you have, you know, lots of money and you want to build something from scratch, although I would not recommend it to a small business starting um, from the ground up, um, you would have to give this structured data as a um, build requirement to the engineers who are building your website. Yeah, cool. That makes perfect sense. So, yeah, our, our store is WooCommerce on WordPress. Um, and heading to my third question here, it's the, the tool that we used to effectively set up all our schema and try and optimize for SEO is um, called Rank Math. And I've used Yoast in the path in the past. And um, I thought Yoast is a great tool for people who I think are a little bit more savvy and completely understand the impact of what they're doing or the, what understand what they're doing and the impact it might have. What I like about Rank Math is it gives you a score. So as you're adjusting your headings and your subheads and your, um, your slugs, and um, all the kind of uh, search 
snippets and things that you can put in there, it kind of gives you a score from zero to 100 and then advises you like, hey, if you use a, uh, like a, um, a number in your H1, that might rank higher. If you haven't used your keyword term in your image alt tags, add that and that will help it rank higher. So it kind of guides you through the process in a really nice way. My question is, how reliable is that? And how do I really know Trustful even accept that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing? Yeah, yeah. So Rank Math, Yoast, all of them do the same thing. They follow the principle of keyword density. Um, so what that basically means is, um, you know, they are suggesting that these are the different places that Google is going to look for, you know, keyword presence to uh, determine how relevant a page is to search. Um, my advice is um, use it as a guide, but don't use it 100%, like don't put that keyword in every single subtitle, because if you do that, you'll get a great score, but it'll be a terrible experience for the user. So it's always a balancing act between excellent copywriting, which is critical. It is the backbone of good SEO, um, as well as great UX. You don't want, you know, if your UX designer does not like the page, do something with that feedback from him or her. Um, and then, of course, do do um, a full sort of read on, you know, how user friendly is this page, um, et cetera. But rank math and yours themselves should not determine what goes on the page. I'm just going to jump in, Sasha. We're just running short of time. So, Erin, I'm going to ask you to ask one question to Tom um, Re Edwards, and we'll just have to scoot through it. So I want to get to everyone's questions because we have a bunch of questions from the audience as well. Sure. Okay. I'll speed it up. So uh, um, thanks, Sasha. appreciate that. Uh, and hello, Tom. So I guess um, as a bit of background, so in a couple of other businesses that I run, we use AdWords um, pretty much exclusively to build our audience. Um, in fact, it works harder than anything else. And we stopped investing in every other form of marketing. When we survey people who came to our business, 90% of them, 85% of them came from an SEO campaign or an SEM campaign rather, and the rest is word of mouth. So I, I found it interesting that you said um, it can't, um, that, there's, that it can't be your primary channel because we're using it that way pretty successfully. But if those two businesses are businesses where we know exactly what people are, are looking for and we're delivering exactly what they're looking for. And so it's very kind of easy to do that. With Song Saga, as you heard me say before, it's quite different. No one's looking for this game. No one's looking for this type of game. None of the combined keywords that we use are really normally put together. So it's been a bit of a challenge there. And then, um, and then the biggest thing, and probably the question I'd like to ask right now is, yes, we're based in Australia, but all of our stock and the biggest audience for us is, is, is in North America and Europe. So given that we spent a bunch of, we spent a bunch of money doing AdWords tests for Song Saga, and it didn't go well. And so when we looked at the data and we looked at an analytics, what I discovered and felt strongly was that our homepage wasn't a really good converting homepage. So we completely- you to ask her your question, sorry, Aaron. Yeah, so we completely rebuilt our, our homepage and now people are coming to the site and instead of saying, hey, cool game, good luck with it. They're saying, cool game, I bought one. So how might we leverage AdWords overseas without spending a ton of money since we're, we're a small growing business? What's the best way to get that global market? Right, definitely. Um, well, I mean, it sounds like you guys are already going to be relatively sophisticated in being able to identify the keywords that like are and aren't working for you, uh, you know, very quickly, right? Um, what I would say is, are you like like how, how are you generating demand right because obviously for a game like this people aren't going to be searching for it but you know if there are other channels that you can use which are going to increase the number of people searching you can geo target them and then you can very carefully understand what the relationship is between let's do a little bit of display or let's do a little bit of facebook or let's do a little bit of even influencer marketing or, or youtube advertising and then on the back of that what do we see happen to our adwords spend um yeah we don't have like Tons of time to go through it, unfortunately. But I mean, if if you are struggling to get into a new area, it's either there's a new media mix needed, you know, just based on the appetites and the consumption behaviors of, of that market, and or you don't understand uh, for this new market how the USPs might be different to your original one uh, or to, to Australia, for example. And that speaks back into the sort of testing that you can do very quickly with AdWords, uh, especially if you guys are confident in your landing page experience. Um, just take a take a moment to iterate through all of the different sort of explainers that you might have then pick the top 10%, go back to what you were doing before and see if that does actually drive uplift. Um, pretty straightforward, yeah. Cool, thanks. Awesome. 
Thanks so much, Aaron. And uh, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Sam, for being so willing to, to ask your questions today. It was great to learn about your businesses as well. We are now going to scoot through questions from the floor. If you would like to ask more questions or upvote the ones, we may not get to all of them, we'll get to as many as we can. And I'll just ask Tom and Sasha if we can answer the questions as quickly as possible. The first ones had loads of votes. <clears throat> um, are we going to get copies of the presentation? We will not be emailing out the slides, but you will get an email with a link to the video. So you can watch the video again and watch the slides again. And we have also been taking notes and we'll email you the notes. Um, next question is thoughts on retargeting and Apple's new restrictions. I don't know who would like to jump in and answer, answer that question. Tom, you're nodding your head. I have, I have strong opinions about that. Um, yeah, so re retargeting uh, or, or all tracking solutions you know that, that facebook are putting out that google are putting out you know ev everything that relies on being able to identify a user across different websites is getting less effective as especially apple but also other vendors push through more sort of consumer privacy friendly uh, approaches to, to letting you or not letting you be tracked across the internet that being said they are still currently extremely effective you know and it's extremely important to include in your media mix uh you know, hey, we have people interact with our website. And then, you know, what sort of messaging do we send back to them? What's crucial is to not just say everyone who ever came to the website, but really break it down by, you know, what they did, try and get a, an indication of what perhaps stage of the purchase uh, journey they're on. You know, is this somebody who engaged with the product really heavily or just sort of dicked around on your homepage for a little bit? Um, start doing that now. It will get less effective over time, but it should still be a key part of uh, your your when we say retargeting, can you just explain what that means to people who don't know? Sure. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, I mean, retargeting is the process by which uh, people who come to your web page have a cookie sort of dropped in their browser. And then on ad platforms uh, like Facebook, for example, um, you're able to send them a targeted message based on the fact that they came to your web page. Awesome. So, Thanks, Tom. Um, and I might just mention now that we have a specific Facebook event next Monday, which we're going to share the link to shortly. And that is actually with the head of business at Facebook. So um, we'll be able to put these questions directly to her um, at the um, at the event next Monday. Um, question is, Tom, does Tom have any recommendations for AdWords courses, people who want to get themselves up to speed on AdWords? No. <laughs> like. Basically not. There, there are there are so many uh, like charlatans and gurus online that my only recommendation would be to stay local. There are a number of extremely good uh, like Skillshare and um, like day workshop or even short course providers uh, in Sydney, you know, Rebecca especially. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of local uh, ways to transfer knowledge you know, in Sydney in Australia. My only recommendation would be would go with somebody uh, who you know has an obvious track record in the community. Uh, if you download, you know, a, a three thousand dollar video course online, your chance of getting basically ripped off is is not high, but much higher than just spending some time with somebody in person. Basically, thank you. I do find it. I don't know, but everybody, I find it easy to go and kind of go face to face, and then I can show them my side and then ask questions. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Google reviews. How relevant are they for B two B? Can they still be effective? I said, do you, do you want to jump in on that one? Um, yeah, reviews in terms of just generally helping you um, show up in results um, for the right sort of locations are really important. And also for people to understand which uh, product is better, et cetera. All of this matters to your search results. Um, but whether it's relevant to B2B would really depend on which industry it's in and how that applies to your specific use case. Okay, well, is there anything you'd like to say? I think are there reviews? So reviews are not just relevant for um, what I'm getting here is that reviews are not just relevant. I'm looking, Googling a mortgage broker in North Ride or a dentist in West Pimple or something. You know, they still help overall. Having reviews is important for my search results. So it doesn't really matter if nobody is searching for me locally. Um, it will help for my overall search result, even if I'm a B2B business. Is that right, Sasha? Yeah, yeah, that sums it up. Okay, cool. Um, so question from Rush, off-page SEO are inbound backlinks still a thing? Um, I know a few years ago, you used to pay someone and they'd, uh, they'd go and get you a whole lot of backlinks to improve your SEO, which seemed to get do, um, <laughs> seemed to become less important over time. But are backlinks still something that you need to focus on, Sasha? 
Yeah, so backlinks are, you know, one of those things that make, gave SEO a really bad name, didn't they? Um, because they were so spammy and, you know, even now in all our accounts, we get a million mails. Um, backlinks are still relevant um, as reputation signals. So the more people will link to your website, the more Google understands that the website is an authority on a particular subject. So there are three things to really remember. One, you, you still need to create good content if you're going to send random backlinks to your domain is not really going to help you. Um, so you have to create good content, reach out to the right people, make it super contextual. So if you have, so for example, with Canva, we reach out to people who are creating great videos and we say, hey, we've got a new feature that you might enjoy using and you know they um, like it. Canva is of course a big name, but on the other flip side, if I have an animal rescue starter kit, and I reach out to animal rescue shelters and I say, um, you know, here's something that you can send out to people who are adopting from your shelter. Um, it'll help them um, keep their house ready. They are likelier to then promote it on their website. So make it contextual, make it really good um, and it'll work for you. If you don't do that, it's, you know, it's not going to work at all. Cool. That's great advice. I'm thinking about who could I could get to link to my website, you know, who would find it useful to link to something that I've written. So. Exactly. Great yeah. advice. On page SEO, this is another one for Sasha. Is there a way to mark up for greater context or voice search? Um, so voice search is still quite a small uh, fraction of what leads to like um, performing SEO for people. But if it is an industry, like for example, if it's travel and you know there is a higher chance that people are using voice search, um, I would just apply the same principles, which is keep the conversa uh, keep the information conversational. So approaching Q and A style um, content is really good for voice search, and also in terms of um, you know guides as well that have different um, article structured data marked up for them. So it's still the same principles. The only difference is that voice search will take into account how conversational and natural that page content is. Cool. Thank you, Tasha. And a couple of questions for Tom. Um, so Google Analytics, is it free to use? Is a question from Anna. Yes, it is. Okay, great. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Um, it's, it's free to use. Uh, to install it on your website uh, is relatively straightforward. There are some other also free tools that can make it easier. Um, but yeah, it's, it's free up until you're running you know, tens of millions of sessions through. And then you might want to upgrade. Cool. And one more question just on spend from Mark. So when you make your decision about how much to spend on Google AdWords, should you be looking at lifetime value of customer or, you know, or should you be looking at immediate value of the customer? I'm, I'm really, really glad that uh, you brought this up because lifetime value of a customer is one of those, I think, incredibly dangerous concepts. Um, obviously, if you are going to spend money on a customer uh, to acquire them through AdWords, their first transaction with you might not pay for uh, the amount of money you spent on them. But ideally, uh, that's a customer for a number of transactions, depending on your business. And over that period of time, they'll pay uh, back for you know, the amount of money that you spent to acquire them in the first place. Many, many businesses are using a lifetime value of the customer to justify very high amounts of spend uh, in, in all paid advertising. This is really uh, useful and good, but actually calculating what the churn rate, the, the length of time a customer interacts with you before they fall off is, is quite complicated. The neat little sort of workaround that I have is how much money do you have left in the business? What's your runway? And how much money is that going to customer going to make you over that time frame? And that's the most that you can spend because there's no good deciding that a customer actually has a 10 year lifespan, but you run out of money in six months, right? Like just work out how much money you can make out of them before you run out of money. And that's, that actually answers the question way better than Bruce Hardy and Peter Thader, some brilliant academics looking at this question, incredibly complicated statistical models. Just when are you going to run out of money and you know, how much money can you make from somebody before that point? Awesome. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Sasha. We are going to have to wrap up because we are seven minutes past three. Um, thank you for all the great questions. We didn't get to all of them, but we did get through most of them. Um, uh, thank you very much to Tom, Sasha, Aaron, and Sam for your time today and for participating in this event. Um, and thank you for the, to the City of Sydney for hosting this, this seminar series. Um, the two events I want to point out that are coming up next, there are six in the series, uh, but next week, is with the special event with Facebook that is with directly Facebook's head of business. 
um, you can register for that one now and it may well fill up because it's we had more than 500 today um, and we do have a capacity with Zoom. So I suggest you register if you want to come along to that one. Um, we also have e-commerce heavyweight. So we have the co-founder of the Iconic and the CEO of Red Balloon. We're talking about how to increase traffic and grow your online store. That is coming up in two weeks time. Um, then we have special events with Canva. We have a special event with Spotify. Um, and then we have more on digital marketing with Mark from Shopo and Karina from Plan. Uh, they're all coming up as well. So please do check out the whole series, which we've just put up in chat. Um, also, um, back to these webinars, if you would like to be a case study in any of the upcoming events, if you see any of them and you think you would like to pose questions to those experts, please message the City of Sydney business email address, which we will now share on chat as well. Um, that's it really, that's a wrap. We're also gonna, actually one more thing, we're sending you a survey. If you could share, we'll put the survey link in the chat, give us two minutes of your time and tell us what you thought of the content today. Will you be using it? And any suggestions for how we can improve the rest of the series? That is really helpful information and it helps us shape the events going forward. Um, thank you again to everyone. We had a huge number of people attending today and I hope to see you all again next week.